All right. So um, let's see. We were talking about um, we were talking about Kantorovich duality, and uh, there's quite a lot more that I can say about that. Um, so let me share. Oops. Let me share a whiteboard. Um, so um, I think uh, yeah, I, I switched points of view to maximize instead of minimize, and so I said. Suppose you have a continuous function on a product of a source and target space, and um, you're given two measures, probability measures on the source and target space. And then I said, if you want to maximize the benefit over all joint measures in the product of the two spaces, uh, mu plus and mu minus, um, then Kanarovich's duality says that this is equal to an infimum. Well, actually, we argued last class that this max is actually attained as long as the measures are compactly supported. And um, this is equal to the infimum of something else. It's the infimum of the expected value of u d mu plus plus v d mu minus, where, so this is a double integral on this side over the product space. Um, where we're going to minimize overall u and v such that the uh, direct sum of u plus v is bigger than v. And sometimes, um, uh, some, I, sometimes I write uh, u and v are in, I don't know what to call it, so let me call it lift b. Um, it's, so u should be l plus, l mu plus integral, integrable, and v should be l mu minus integral, and then the sum of ux plus vy should be bigger than b for all x and y. And I sort of said, um, well, we so we'd almost written down a proof yesterday or Thursday. Uh, and I said that the proof, it, the, this proof is kind of powerful. Actually, the history of this proof is that uh, I, I discovered this proof and wrote it down with Gangbo in the early 90s. And then we, uh, later uh, realized that um, that um, yes, I, I see the comment from Mick uh, in the um, in the about whiteboards. But I'll think about it. Um, and um, this, I realized that Brazis also wrote down a version of this proof. I guess in the eighties, in a different context, which he recently published. Uh, but um, in, in the discrete context. So, um, so how does this proof of Brzezis go? Um, so the proof is basically step one is the max is attained, which we argued last class. And step two, which we also argued last class is that um, the support of gamma, which is the smallest closed set of full mass, is has this B-cyclical monotonicity property. And the third step of the proof is that then it follows from the Rockefeller-Roche th theorem that um, there is a, a function u, um, which takes m plus into the reals, possibly taking infinity as a value at some points, such that um, the support of gamma is contained in the B subdifferential of u, where, um, where the B subdifferential is basically the set of points x and y such that um, u at any point z is bigger than um, u of x plus b of zy minus b of xy for all z. And um, So uh, what, what this tells me, what this inequality here tells me is that um, 
rather what this identity tells me is that um, if I rewrite this inequality a slightly different way, um, maybe it's useful to, um, so if I rewrite this inequality a slightly different way, um, it says that u of x, uh, in fact, right, let's, sorry. It says that b of x, y minus u of x is bigger than um, b of x of z, y minus u of z for all z. And so, of course, it's bigger than the supremum. And of course, x is one possible value of z, and so I have equality. So in fact, sorry, i.e. x, y in B subdifferential view implies this. Sorry, let me write this so it can be read. And this function here is, is um, going to, we're, this is sometimes called the B transform of U. So it's a function of Y when you take the supremum in M plus. Um, and so this is, so if I take this function here to be V of Y, what that says, it says two things. It says that first of all, um, V plus U satisfies this constraint because V of Y, sorry, this is, let me try to write this a little more legibly once more. Um, it's, it says that V of Y is bigger than V of X, Y uh, minus U, X. Um, and this holds for any X, basically. If I define, if I define V of Y this way, then I have this inequality for all X and Y. And then on top of it, if X and Y is in the support in the uh, sub B subdifferential view, then equality holds. And it's actually if and only if X, Y is in the B subdifferential view. And this is the inequality here that if you integrate, okay, so now we're in good shape. Is everyone happy with this so far? Okay. Um, this is the inequality here that if I integrate it against some gamma with the correct marginals, is gonna tell me that the stuff on this side, last class we saw it was bigger than this. And this is gonna tell me that for this particular U that I've constructed using the rockefeller roche theorem, um, equality holds. Okay, so next next page. Um, U of X plus V of Y is bigger than V of X, Y for all X and Y. Equality if X and Y is in support of gamma. And so now uh, letting take any gamma, in fact, the gamma that we had before, if we want, um, as before, so the optimal gamma, uh, sorry, if X and Y is in BU, but that's contained in sport gamma. And now I integrate this against gamma, and what I get is um, integral UX, d gamma x y, but that's since u doesn't depend on y, that's like integral d mu plus because the left marginal of gamma is nu, plus integral v y d mu minus because the right marginal of gamma is y, and because equality holds for all for all gamma, almost all gamma, whatever. Um, I get that that's equal to b d gamma, and so uh, we had previously proved uh, we previously proved that um, this the inf of this plus this was at least as big as the soup of this guy. And now we found a case of equality.
So this case of equality says, aha, equality holds here. Any questions? Well, okay, so um, let me see. Um, I, I should be slightly careful because I should be slightly careful at this step because um, I can worry a little bit. Um, does integral u x to gamma x y really equal um, u d mu plus? And what can I worry about? I can worry that if u is taking both signs, positive and negative, and if it's not, if u was not continuous, then I might worry that uh, somehow this integral diverges. Um, so I need at least one of the two, either the positive part of u to be integral against mu plus or the negative part to be integral in order to have a definite value for this. And um, so need either um, the positive part of u to be an L1 d mu plus or the negative part. And similarly for, for the positive and negative part of V, I need, I need in fact the same one of both um, to be sure. So what I could worry about is that, you know, this has, this integral has a well-defined value, but maybe neither of these integrals is well-defined and maybe one of them is plus infinity and one is minus infinity and they, they add up to be something undefined. And um, I'm helped here by the fact that I'm saved. What am I saved by? I'm saved by the fact that I was assuming the spaces were compact and the VU was continuous, essentially. Um, um, so I have, um, I have U of X is bigger than um, V of X, Y naught minus V of Y naught for every Y naught. And this function is continuous. And as long as I'm working on compact spaces, it's bounded from below. And this is a constant. And so that tells me that yes, the negative part of u plus is integral. And similarly, um, similarly, v minus v plus is L1 d mu minus. And so neither of these integrals can diverge to minus infinity. They can only diverge to plus infinity, but they can't really diverge to plus infinity because of this equality and this, this being a finite number. Any questions? All right. Um, can I ask a couple of questions? Sure. Who's, sorry, who's asking? Uh, it's me, Hung Yi. Oh, yeah, yeah, Hung Yi, good. Uh, uh, so, uh, first, first question is: So, given uh, uh, given u and v, how do we reconstruct the gamma? That is the, uh, the, the yeah, and and then also uh, in this construction of u and v, you started out with applying all the b cyclically monotone stuff to construct u, and then you constructed v from u. So yep. this seems somewhat asymmetric. Uh, is that like a, would there be a difference if you started with v and then you constructed u from v? Um, yeah, these are reasonable questions. Um, but uh, let's see. I'm going to I'm going to answer the first question in a little while. Although I I'm going to give a partial answer to the first question. Um, so I don't know. I I know that you weren't. Uh, I, maybe you didn't make the lectures last week. Have you had a chance to watch them yet? Or yes, I've watched the. the video. Okay. So um so in cases where the B has additional properties, like it did for uh, the Brenier class function, where it was like the Euclidean distance squared or Euclidean distance to a power bigger than one, then there's a nice construction for getting um for getting gamma from U. Hmm. And I'm going to show. We're going to talk about that. I, I think today hopefully today. Um, in cases where the B is not so nice, for example, for the Euclidean power to the first distance, um, it's not so easy to reconstruct gamma. The problem is that basically when, when, when B is nice, like the distance squared, there's a unique gamma. And then, then you get it in a fairly rigid way from either U or V. When the B is not so nice, like the Euclidean distance, there's lots of gammas. Uh, I talked about this example with the book shifting. 
And so there's no canonical way to select one from you and you need to introduce some additional principle. And so that's in fact, um, uh, it was somehow much harder to construct exist. So the quest after you had Kanarovich solutions, the question was, does the Kanarovich solution provide a solution in the sense of Monge, in the sense of a map between mu plus and mu minus that pushes mu forward plus mu for forward to mu minus. And that question was not answered by Kanarovich, despite the fact that he made the connection with Monge's work. And people were focused on the Euclidean distance, which was Monge's uh, original cost. And the first sort of proof that you could actually construct a map in the sense of Monge was, came in the late 70s by a Russian mathematician named Sudakov. Uh, although it turned out uh, 25 years later, it was realized that it had a gap in it. And about 25 years later, other proofs were given by Evans Gangbo first and, in 1999, and then a couple of years later by myself and Feldman and Caffarelli, and also independently Ambrosio and Trudinger and Wong, um, which didn't have gaps in them. <laughs> and But basically it's exactly because it's in the cases where there's no unique solution, the, the solution gamma is non-unique, there's no canonical reconstruction of gamma from you, you need to make some additional choices. And, and the problem is that you need to make the choices in a kind of, mm, consistent way. So like, if you imagine I'm doing a problem in two dimensions, for example, if, um, you, you're trying to transport a, a radially symmetric, a, a spherically symmetric distribution in two dimensions to another spherically symmetric distribution in two dimensions. So basically by the symmetry of the situation, every all the transport is gonna happen along rays that start at the origin and go outward. And you could choose on some rays to do an order preserving transformation and on other rays to do an order reversing transformation. And if you were to choose a non-measurable set of rays to do the order preserving transformation on and the complement to the order reversing transformation on, you would end up with a mass. Yeah, I see. So that's why, why it's a little bit tricky uh, in these cases where V doesn't have these nice additional properties to reconstruct gamma from V. But basic, I mean, basically you look at this set, this V subdifferential of U, and you try to figure out a map whose graph lives in the B subdifferential of U. And then if you can find such a map, you hope that it solves the Monge problem for you. And, and when there's a unique map in that B subdifferential, then you win. And when the map's non-unique, then you have to take care that you choose, make, make good choices. Okay, thank you. Yeah, other questions? Um. Okay, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna switch whiteboards again. Um, so an annoying so th I, on the one hand, this proof is uh, is quite um, it's it's rigorous. It's easy to make this proof rigorous. It takes it's a bit more trouble if the measures are not compactly supported, uh, because then 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 you then you have to worry about is u plus or u minus l one. And in case the measures extend to infinity, it depends on the growth of b at infinity whether or not you can be guaranteed of this. Um, but uh, this proof is not so intuitive. Uh, I mean, it's, it's intuitive after you've seen it, it's not so easy to come up with it. Um, so let me, uh, so there's another proof which is more intuitive but harder to make rigorous. And uh, let me talk about that a little bit. Um, so there's another proof which is based on, on game theory. Um, in fact, the, the, so what is game theory? So this is an aside on game theory. Um, so basically, if we look at two player zero sum games, that's the simplest case. Then basically there's a set of strategies for player one he chooses a strategy X from some set capital X. Player two chooses a strategy Y from some set capital Y. And then there's a payoff given by some function of the strategies chosen from P1 to P2. This is basically the setup for game theory. And uh, you know the typical example that, uh, you use, that people use to motivate this is in the soccer when you have penalty kicks. Um, usually the kicker will either kick to the left side of the net or the right side of the net. So the kicker maybe has two strategies to choose from. 
And usually the goalie doesn't have time to react to the kicker. So the goalie more or less has to decide in advance to dive to the left side of the net or to the right side of the net. And so the goalie has two strategies to choose from. And then if they both dive to the same side, the payoff is good for the goalie. The goalie has a good chance of blocking the goal. And if the kicker kicks the opposite side, then the goalie, then the payoff is good to the kicker because with high probability, the kicker scores, although occasionally he misses the net and whatever. Um, and, um, and when you think of this as like a discrete strategy game, there's no equilibrium because, um, you know, if the goalie knows what the kicker is going to do, then the goalie will imitate the kicker. And if the kicker knows what the goalie is going to do, then the kicker will kick to the opposite side. So if, if either one knows the other strategy, then they can win. And so it's a big disadvantage in this game to be forced to declare your strategy first. And so um, if P1 declares strategy first, oh yes, and I should say, um, we're gonna assume the players are rational, which means that they know the payoff function, they know the strategies their opponent has at their disposal and they'll do the best thing that they can given that information. So if player one declares the strategy first, then the payoff, then player two will, so that's like, oh, player one wants to minimize the payoff and because it's a payoff from player one to player two, uh, P1 wants to minimize and P2 wants to maximize. So this is the simplest case of game theory because it's basically a, a, a variational problem, you know, it's, and it's the same variational problem while well, they're talking in opposite directions. And what, what's, what, when game theory gets really tricky is uh, when the game is not zero sum, so, um, or when you have more than two players. So then each individual player has a variational problem, but game theory is really studying how all these different optimization problems interact with each other. Um, so if player one declares strategy first, the result's going to be that um, player one's trying to minimize overall his strategies X, but player two gets to react to X. And so after X is chosen, player two is going to maximize his strategy Y depending on X. And the playoff is going to be the infimum of the supremum. And if, play, if player two declares their strategy first, the result's going to be... Um, so player two wants to maximize, but player one gets to react to player two's strategy. Oh, sorry, player one's trying to minimize. And the result will be this one. And it's always true that um, this is gonna be a better outcome for player one. And this is gonna be an, a better outcome for player two. So there's a natural inequality here, which um, it goes like this. This, this, this value here is no bigger than this value here. And in general, like in the soccer uh, penalty kick game, uh, these two values are gonna be different because if you know your opponent's strategy, then you can do much better than if you don't. And, but there's, there are special situations in which these two values that are a priori uh, different uh, happen to coincide. And um, so this was realized, by, I guess, by von Neumann. Um, so there's a, a nice theorem by von Neumann. I mean, it's actually hard to find this in von Neumann's works, but you, in Kakutani has a paper from the 30s where he attribute he writes this down, he attributes it to von Neumann, he generalizes it, and he attributes it to von Neumann, um, which says that um, I don't know what to call these. Maybe I, sh I should call this like v um, one and v two, value one and value two. Um, if the strategy spaces are both compact and convex in some Euclidean space, and both functions, and for every, if I fix x naught and y naught, then if the map x goes 
to p of x y naught is convex. And similarly, the map on y, uh, since y is trying to maximize, we'll put a minus sign here. And actually, you don't really need them to be convex. You, you need them to have convex level sets, sublevel sets. then V1 equals V2. So that's the statement of the theorem. And uh, so what this is really doing, so I try to draw a picture. Um, so if player one's strategies are running in, in this direction and player two strategies are running in that direction, now player one is trying to minimize. So for each strategy of player two, he sees something like this and player two is trying to maximize. So for each strategy of player one, he sees something like this because of this minus sign. So the, this is my payoff function P of X, Y. Um, what, what, this, what this theorem is trying to do is find a saddle. And the, the saddles, so um, one of the inf soup says that, um, for each value of x, you maximize in y, and then you minimize among values of x, and so you find the bottom of the saddle. And the soup int says for each value of y, you first minimize in x, and then you max, so to get here maybe, and then you maximize in x, so you find the, the saddle. And so what this theorem is doing is it's trying to find a saddle point in the function for you, and it's saying, yes, you can always find a saddle point, it provided the function is convex in the x direction and concave in the y direction. And so let me uh, let me sketch a proof of this theorem, which it's sort of straightforward to prove in finite dimensions. When like with, for finite k, it's harder to prove in infinite dimensions. And um, what I want to argue is that the um, the let me prove it first. But then afterwards, what I want to argue is that the Kandorovich duality that theory that we just saw is kind of an infinite dimensional analog of this uh, finding a saddle business. Questions? Okay. Um, so, so it's the, the proof, I would really like the functions to be strictly convex. So assume um, convexity of PXY with respect to X is strict and concavity and if not work with um you can make it strict by perturbing it so define p epsilon to be the original p plus let's say epsilon x squared minus y squared. And so you can add something that's strictly convex in y, x and strictly concave in y, and prove the theorem for p epsilon, and then use the compactness of capital X and capital Y to show that as you let epsilon go to zero, you get the result you want. And um, the result of assuming the convexity of px, uh, str the strict convexity of pxy is that um, then when you do like the minimum, when you, when you compute say infimum of pxy for given y naught, first of all, it's attained because x is compact and p is continuous. So this is a min. And secondly, it's uniquely attained because of the strict convexity. And so, of course, where it's attained is going to depend on my why not. And so let me call it um, 
x b of y naught. Um, and similarly, um, argmax of px naught y over y in capital Y is going to be uniquely attained. And let me call the point that attains it y b of x naught. And here, um, basically, the B stands for best response. So if player two is going to choose strategy Y naught, then X B of Y naught is the best response of player one to that strategy. And um, similarly, if player one is going to choose strategy X naught, then the Y that attains this maximum is the best response of player two. And these best response functions, well, uh, so XB takes player two strategies into player one strategies, and YB takes player one strategies into player two strategies. And the other thing, the other nice feature of the strict convexity and strict concavity, as I've assumed, is that um, these functions are going to be continuous. Why are they going to be continuous? Can anyone think why they would be continuous? I mean, I guess, I guess, on the one hand, it seems pretty natural that, uh, I, I mean, sorry, I guess I wasn't, maybe, let me go back to the statement for a second. Um, maybe I wasn't careful to state that P is continuous. Um, so I should have included continuous in the hypothesis. So, um, so P should be a continuous function on X cross Y. And that's uh, in particular that helps guarantee that um, that the max and the min are attained. And um, so basically, how does this go? Um, if you had a sequence of x's converging, if if you had x k converging to x infinity, x m x i whatever converging to x infinity, um, then the fact that y b Um, is the best response. So I'd have P of XI Y is less than P of XI YB of XI for all Y and integers I. And so you would take, um, you would take a limit of this statement and because the space Y is compact, this, this sequence here would have some subsequential limit. So along a subsequence, um, YB of XI is gonna converge to Y infinity say, and taking a limit of this inequality is gonna, and is gonna say that X infinity Y is less than P of X infinity Y infinity, for all y. And so y infinity would be the best response. Yeah. This is supposed to be x infinity here. And um, and so far this is along a subsequence, but basically because the maximizer is unique, uh, it, I can choose any subsequence and then a subsequence of a subsequence and the YBs always have to converge to the same guy because of the strict convexity, the maximizer in at X infinity has to be unique. And so that shows continuity. Is it clear? Um, so these maps are continuous. And then we're helped and the, the sets, the Y and the X are 
compact convex sets. So the Y and the X are topological balls, basically closed balls. They're compact sets of some Euclidean space. Um, maybe if different X and Y might have different dimensions, but I don't care. Um, um, X compact and convex in RK implies X is uh, a top of is a closed ball. Topologically, it's homeomorphic to a closed ball. To a closed ball. And so if I compose YB with XB, XB composed with YB, I get a map from X to itself. And uh, whenever you have a, a continuous map from a closed Euclidean ball to itself, that continuous map always has a fixed point. So there's Brouwer's theorem. Every uh, continuous map, a closed uh, Euclidean ball has a fixed point. And so in particular, what that means is that I can find some strategy X naught such that um, such that X B of Y B of X naught is X naught. And so I'm gonna set Y naught to be Y B of X naught. And so uh, if I translate this back into the language of game theory, that means that X, player one has some strategy such that the best response of player two to that strategy is Y naught, and the best response of player one to player two strategy Y naught is again X naught, which means there's something that the goalie can do such that whatever the, when the kicker reacts to it, the goalie's best reaction to what the, the kicker's reaction is what he was originally doing anyways. That's a saddle point. So my claim is X naught Y naught is the desired saddle. And um, because what? Um, so P of X naught Y naught, uh, player one was trying to minimize the payoff among all choices X. So this has got to be less than P of X Y naught. And player one, that's, that's um, and player two was trying to maximize the payoff among all choices Y. And so this has to be bigger than P Y naught of X. That's what it means for these both to be best response functions. And um, so in particular, uh, I can take the, the inf over X here and the soup over Y here. And then if I take an inf over X, a soup over Y, what I get is clearly less than this. And similarly, this is clearly less than a soup over y inf over x. And that was the opposite inequality to the one that we had before. If I go, so this is, uh, if I go back a slide uh, or two, um, V1, the inf soup was a priori bigger than V2. And now I have V1 being less than V2. And so that shows equality holds. Is it clear? Oh, hi, the, Professor. I have a question here. Sure. Um, do we need the map to be something like strongly convex? Because I, I think Convexity is not um like we, we need the um optimal point to be unique, right? So sure. right, right. So um so uh, so I said assume assume the convexity is strict. 
Oh, mm -hmm. okay, okay, I see. Thanks. And I said, if it's not strict, then you can perturb it to make it strict. Do the argument for the perturbed problem, get the conclusion for the perturbed problem, and then let epsilon go to zero to, to recover oh. the conclusion for the original problem. Okay, I see. Oh, I see. Thanks. Thanks. That was a good question. Um, and so, as a, so, there's a famous, of course, what. Um, Nash's contribution to two-player zero-sum game theory, at least as far as I understand it, I'm far from being a historian of mathematical economics, but uh, but um, so there was this famous example. So uh, Nash was troubled, maybe some of you have seen A Beautiful Mind, but uh, Nash was struggling to find the governing equation for be human behavior. And um, it bothered him that there was this kind of instability in the soccer kicker goaltender problem where as soon as one person knows the other one's strategy, that one person's going to change their strategy. And so the situation is kind of unstable. And so what Nash proposed was uh, we allow what's called randomized strategies. So instead of the kicker having to choose between diving left and right, he can choose to dive left with a certain probability and right with the complementary probability. And so P1 does uh, strategy I from, let's say, M choices with probability, uh, let's say, MI, or maybe M plus I. And P2 does strategy J from N choices with probability, uh, let's say, M minus J. So the sum of the mi pluses is equal to one, which is also the sum of the mi minuses. And um, if the payoff, if, if everybody's risk neutral, so the payoff is just the expected value of the payoffs for the pure strategies, Right, so that would be just um, so if I have a ma payoff matrix P i j, and then I take expectations, so I'm going to do the sum on i and j of m i plus m j minus P i j. Um, then I'm in a, I'm and the strategy spaces are basically, so my capital X is like this. It's the set of vectors mi plus with non-negative entries that sum to one. And my capital Y is again, the set of vectors mi minus in Rn, m minus i bigger than, or minus j bigger than zero, such that they add up to one. Um, this is a simplex, it's a convex set, compact convex set. This is also a compact convex set. This function for each m minus is a linear function of mi. For each m plus is a linear function of m minus. So it's bilinear. So in particular, for each m plus, it's a concave function of m minus. And for each m minus, it's a convex function of m plus. This is the case where strict, we don't have strict convexity a priori. But um, this is a situation where it holds. And so um, by von Neumann's theorem, that implies a saddle exists. And so by moving from the space of deterministic strategies to the space of probabilistic strategies, we get from a situation where you didn't have a uh, stable equilibrium to a situation where you do have a stable equilibrium. There'll be some choices of probability for the, the goaltender and some other choices of probability for the kicker, such that even if they knew each other's probabilities, they wouldn't want to change their strategy. So allowing randomized strategies. And this was somehow uh, one of Nash's contributions. Strategies provides an equilibrium even if the discrete game didn't have one.
Similarly, when you play the game rock, paper, scissors, um, you know, if you do the same, if you do rock every time, you're going to lose every time because your opponent will quickly figure out that you're doing rock every time and he'll win. But if you do eat rock, paper, and scissors, each with probability one third, then you have just a good a chance as your opponent of winning. So this was why, you know, Trump was always saying, I can't be, I, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but he was always saying, I can't be predictable. I can't be predictable because someone had told him this about game theory, that if you, if you behave predictably, it, you enable your opponent to, to defeat you in a lot of situations. Um, <clears throat> okay, great. So that's, that was sort of an aside into economics and uh, this kind of two player zero sums games. Uh, so now let me come back to what does this have to do with Kantorovich duality? So in the in this story, player one is going to choose a non-negative measure, gamma, on the product space. And player two is going to choose a pair of functions, u and v, um, let's say from L1 d mu plus L1 d mu minus. And the payoff function. is going to depend on these two choices, gamma and u and v. Uh, maybe I bet. All right, sorry. Uh, let me, I guess for my sign conventions, I better flip this around. I better make this p2 and p1. Because player one was trying to minimize and player two was trying to maximize. Um, I can tell I'm going to get myself into a little trouble here, but okay. So, um, so, and let's let's see. Let me see if I can write down the payoff function correctly. It's going to be ugh. all right. Let me switch back. Sorry, I'm making a mess on this. Um, so, player. One is trying to minimize among gamma. So I guess it's going to be something like u of x plus v of y minus v of xy d gamma xy. And then there'll be two additional integrals added to this, which are like minus integral u d mu plus minus integral v d mu minus. So that's my payoff function. It's a little bit degenerate, but um, but for each fixed u and v, notice that it's a linear, it's an affine linear function of gamma, because gamma appears only here. And for each fixed gamma, it's an affine linear function of u and v, because it's linear in u, linear in v, linear in u, linear in v. Um, so just like the randomized strategy game, this is sort of it's linear up to addition of constants. So uh, for example, for, for when I fix u and v, these are the constants I'm adding and, and these guys, and then it's linear and gamma. Uh, finally, bilinear. And so it, uh, and the strategy spaces are convex. And so we have kind of all the geometric structure of Nash's theorem. We don't have the topological structure because the strategy spaces are not compact. And also it's infinite dimensional and the, the version of the, the von Neumann theorem that I stated was in finite dimensions. But so at least the geometric structure looks right. There's some questions. So the problem with making this rigorous is the topology doesn't quite work. And then you would have to work, work to make to make this work in infinite dimensions. You'd have to introduce new techniques or whatever. Um, but in any case, the intuition that it provides is correct and is pretty useful in figuring out. So if somebody else gives you a different infinite dimensional linear minimization on a convex set. Um, this kind of approach that I'm showing you now is quite useful for figuring out what the dual problem is going to be, whereas the proof that I showed you for the Kenner-Rich duality is almost useless. I mean, somehow it doesn't provide enough intuition to figure out in a different situation what the correct dual is going to be, but this two-player zero-sum game approach does, at least in my experience. Okay, so now, um, so now, um, v1 which was the case where i do the inf soup 
is going to be inf on gamma in positive measures soup on uv in l1 cross l1 or plus l1 and of this payoff function and so what's going to happen so let me fix a gamma and do the maximum on u and v and so then i'm going to write the payoff function in a slightly different way i'm going to write it in the form uh, ux uh, d gamma xy minus d mu plus x and i'll have um vy d gamma xy minus d mu minus y and then a leftover is going to be minus b d gamma and the point is for any fixed gamma when i do this maximum unless mu plus is the left marginal of gamma i'm going to be able to choose this u to make this room go to plus infinity and then it won't contribute to this infimum at all and similarly unless the right marginal of gamma is mu minus I'm going to be able to choose a sequence of V, which make this supremum go to plus infinity and won't contribute to this infimum. And so it's going to wind up being um, the soup is going to be either plus infinity unless gamma has the correct marginals. And if gamma has the correct marginals, then these two integrals are going to vanish and I'll be left with V to gamma otherwise. And so that's what the soup is going to equal. And so then I'll be left, and I'm left with this inf. And so this, this inf, it turns, uh, apart from this minus sign, if I pull the minus through, it's going to be supremum over all gamma in plus minus integral b d gamma. And so the, up, up to this minus sign, this is the maximum in the Kantorovich problem. And so we're going to look at V1 and we're going to see that V, or rather, we're going to look at V2 and we're going to see that V2 is the minimum of the Kantorovich problem. So, what does V2 correspond to? It corresponds to interchanging the order of the infimum and the supremum. And so, and still with this payoff function. Okay, anyone want to take a screenshot? So, V2 is going to be the soup over uv and l1 inf over gamma non-negative basically um and then the payoff was uh u plus v minus b d gamma minus u d mu plus minus v d mu minus and so now um basically if the expression here is positive then the infimum will be attained when gamma is zero and if the expression here takes a negative value somewhere then by putting a huge dirac mass if gamma assigns a huge dirac mass at the point where this u plus v minus b is negative this infimum will go to minus infinity and won't contribute to the supremum so this infimum is either minus u d mu plus minus v d mu minus if u and v are in what I think we call lip b and it's going to be minus infinity else. And so now taking the supremum, the supremum reduces to supremum of u and v in lip b of minus um, u d, uh, d mu plus minus vd mu minus, which again, up to this annoying minus sign, it's the inf in the Kantorovich duality formula. And so some of the moral of this story is that um, inf um, soup equals soup inf, or let's say, it, you always have this, and equality holds with appropriate convexity. Convexity of both the domains and the payoff in the correct directions.
So you often want to know, is, is it legitimate to interchange the order of an int and a soup? And von Neumann's theorem gives you conditions where it is legitimate. Any questions? All right. So on the other hand, uh, it it hasn't it still hasn't given us so much intuition into what are the roles that u and v are playing. And so let me draw on one other economic um, application that motivates some intuition into what our u and v are doing. And this is the um, stable marriage problem with transfer utility. Um, so this story is, um, uh, so e economists use this to match thing, this kind of model to match things like workers with firms, uh, husbands with wives, um, I guess, uh, students with places in schools. They would use, I, I described the medical residency match in the previous lecture. They would actually use a non-transferable utility version to do that, but the non-transferable utility version isn't connected to optimal transport. So, so, um, so in this transferable utility world, the idea would be that um, let um, d mu plus be a distribution of wives, or just mu, mu plus be a distribution of, of women, and mu minus a distribution of men. And you would suppose that um, if you pair woman X with man Y, then that generates a surplus. Or if you pair worker X with firm Y. So you can think of B of XY as a, an amount of dollars if you want. And then the partners X and Y negotiate on who gets to keep what share of the surplus. And everybody tries to maximize their own share. So the firm tries to pay the worker as little as they can and still hire him. The worker tries to get the biggest salary they can and still be hired. And the market determines where in that range the salary lands. Um, so what do we seek? So we seek a pairing which matches the workers to firms or the husbands, the women, the wives to husbands or whatever. Um, and so what it, um, okay, maybe I shouldn't say it this way. So let me say we see comparing gamma matching uh, X's to Y's. And we, and we also seek, um, and so this is the direct payoff. B is the direct payoff. But the indirect payoff is what share does the worker X and firm Y get to keep. And indirect payoffs and such the three conditions hold and the first condition is what's called market clearing, uh, which in this in this simplified model means that all the all the workers and firms get matched up. So in other words, the left marginal of gamma should be mu plus, and the right marginal should be mu minus. All individuals get matched. And the second thing that we want is um, stability. So we want the payoff 
to a type X individual plus the payoff to a type Y individual to be at least as big as they could generate if they paired with each other. Because if this, if, if this were not the case, then um, X and Y would be motivated to leave whoever they're partnered with, pair with each other, generate a larger amount than their current indirect payoffs and split it in some way such that both of them are better off. That's why that's called a stability and equality. And then, and so the, so the first condition has only to do with gamma, with who's paired with whom. The second condition has only to do with what the individuals are receiving in terms of compensation. And the third inequality relates the two things. And let's say it's a budget constraint. See, it's easy to be stable if you're allowed to pay the X's and the Y's as much as you want. You give them all a million dollars and you certainly satisfy the stability inequality. But the problem is that the pairings you set up may not generate enough millions of dollars to do that. And so the budget constraint is that the surplus generated by the pairings is actually enough to pay uh, partner X U and partner Y V for every, um, for gamma, almost every X and Y. Right, so the, so the difference, the first condition has to hold for all X and Ys, the, the, the middle condition rather, the second condition, the last condition only has to hold for those gammas, those X and Ys that are actually partnered with each other. So gamma basically says who marries whom, U and V says which, which wife and which husband gets to keep which share of the surplus the marriage is generating. And um, the budget constraint says, the surplus generated by each marriage is actually enough to pay the husbands and wives. And now if you have a husband and a wife that are not married to each other, it can well be the case that their individual payoffs are adding up to more than what they would be if they were married to each other. And that's good. That's exactly what you want for stability. And, um, and so then in this stable marriage problem, so by the way, Donald Knuth, the same guy that wrote a, um, the book, the monthly volume series, The Art and Science of Computer Programming. He took time out from that to write a little tiny pamphlet at the Centre de Recherche de Mathematique in 1976. I think he had breakfast with John Conway, and Conway explained this to him, and you took time out to write it up in a little book. I guess he gave a, a series of lectures at CRM that the book was based on. Um, and one of the questions is, you know, if you're given this distribution of women and men and this set of surpluses, can you always find a stable pairing? Uh, uh, a gamma and a UV satisfying one, two, and three. And the Kanarovich duality theorem says, yes, you can. So um, in other words, if you take gamma to maximize the expected value of B and U and V to minimize the, or the U and V from Kanarovich's duality. So to minimize integral U d mu plus plus integral V d mu minus subject to this constraint, um, the fact that you get the same value in the maximization problem and the minimization problem tells you, yes, the third equality is holding gamma almost everywhere. in the transfer utility setting in the model we just described. And I, I find that uh, somehow for me, that's the most intuitive uh, way of thinking about the relationship between U and V and gamma are these three conditions that were written down on the previous slide, these three. Okay. So now let me, um, let me, in the time that's remaining, I'm going to try to address um, Hernie's question, which was how can, if we have U and V, how can we reconstruct gamma? I see Hernie has another question. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually have another question also, uh, which is, um, uh, so uh, if, uh, so, so you said that U and V are, uh, uh, indirect payoffs that they get from yep. the pairing, but right. if I didn't misunderstand, but 
U doesn't depend on who X was paired to and Y doesn't depend on who Y was paired to. So is it they just get money for doing nothing? Is that what happens? So, so U is a function from the different identities of women into the real numbers. And it says which woman gets which amount of money. And V is a function from the different types of men into the real numbers. It says which type of men gets which, um, which amount of money. So the U and V... The U and V do depend on X and Y, right? And I've written that. Uh, they, but but they, 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 the U and V do not depend on uh, who is married to whom. Yeah, they, right. So they don't depend on who's married to whom. Um, and you could have two, two men of type X, or two, two women of type X and two men of type Y, and you could permute the partners and it wouldn't affect anything. Okay. And w w would you mind repeating again what happened if if the stable inequality if that is reversed why that would be unstable right so um so if there exists x naught y naught not necessarily married to each other such that u x naught plus v of y naught is less than the benefit right so Wife X, or yeah. so wife X is getting a uh, hundred thousand dollars. Husband Y is getting a hundred thousand dollars. But if they marry each other, it would generate three hundred thousand dollars. Then they would both like to leave their partners, give up the hundred thousand dollars that they're each getting, marry each other to win the three hundred thousand dollars, and then they could split it a hundred and fifty each, or one hundred and twenty-five, one hundred and seventy-five. They would both be better off. But no, no matter who they're married, they will get $100,000 anyway, right? No, 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 no. Uh, so uh, so that you, you, get, you have this collection of marriages. The marriage of X to Y generates a surplus, B of X, Y. The, the husband and wife that are actually involved in that marriage, the, amounts that they, the amount of that surplus they get has to add up to B of X, Y. So, right? That's this third condition is for each... For each husband and wife, for each worker and firm that are actually paired with each other, the, the worker's salary plus the marginal revenue to the firm have to add up to the whatever extra productivity that we're pairing that worker and that firm generates. And how much you get, right? It depends on who, it depends on, on your properties, but it also depends on who else is in the market, right? So if there's only if there's only one um if there's only if Brad Pitt is in the market, then the most attractive woman to Brad Pitt is going to get a share of whatever Brad Pitt is worth. And so whether or not, uh, you know, whether or not Madonna gets that share of what Brad Pitt's worth depends whether there's a, another woman in the market who's more attractive to Brad Pitt than Madonna is. But, you know, whoever's married to Brad Pitt, the sum of their two payoffs have to add up to whatever is generated by the marriage of Brad Pitt to that woman. I am still confused, but I feel like I, I just need to think really hard on my own about this. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, anyway. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, didn't want to do that quite yet. Let's go back to this one. Um, okay, so I wanted to come back to your earlier question, which was, um, how would this work for like the, so somehow what we'd like to do is we'd like to do something like Brenier's theorem. Oh uh, yeah, so sorry, there's questions in the chat. Um, uh, well, so Ilya's question is, it sounds like U should depend on both X and Y and V should also depend on both X and Y, but, um, but in fact, in this transferable utility model, U only depends on the identity of X of the woman and V only depends on the identity Y of the man. Um, there are more complicated versions of this model where they would depend on both variables, like if there were hidden variables or something. And let's see. Um, right. So, um, so okay, so let's think. Um, so now let's come back to the situation where at least M plus is a manifold. So we had M plus and F minus. So far, they were just like metric spaces, Polish spaces. Now, suppose... M plus is a manifold. Um, 
maybe even before I do that, I should say something else. What should I say? I should say, um, so let me just make this remark. Um, so there's kind of these necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. So gamma with the correct marginals optimizes B if and only if there exist um, U and V in the set lip B such that, um, what does it mean to be in the set lip B? It means that u of x plus vy is bigger than dxy. And what does optimality of gamma mean? This is for all x and y. With equality, gamma almost everywhere. So that's point one. And point two is conversely, u and v in the B, um, optimize the dual problem if and only if there exists gamma in this space joint such that the same condition holds. Right, so a, a set of marriages between the men and women is optimal if and only if you can find out payoffs via UX plus VY, which are stable and which satisfy the budget constraint. And similarly, a set of payoffs is optimal in dual problem if and only if you can find a set of marriages such that not only do the payoffs satisfy the stability constraint, they also satisfy the budget constraint. And so this is in some sense, these two conditions are the Euler-Lagrange conditions, the necessary and sufficient conditions for minimality in these two linear minimizations on convex sets. And um, in the case where, where, so you can think of, if you think about the first problem, the maximization over gamma, you can think of this U and V as being like Lagrange multipliers for the marginal constraints for gamma. So it's the existence of a set of Lagrange multipliers. And similarly, if you think of the second problem where you're maximizing U and V, you can think of the gamma as being a Lagrange multiplier for this inequality constraint. So the constraints on gamma are equality constraints, the marginals, and so uh, the U and V are, don't have signs. The constraints on the U and V are an inequality constraint, and so the gamma is non-negative. The Lagrange multiplier gamma is non-negative. Um, and maybe it's worth, so, maybe it's worth mentioning that, um, so usually in calculus, um, you know, when you minimize a function on an open set and you have an interior minimum, the derivative has to vanish and the second derivative has to be non-negative. So the vanishing of the first derivative and the non-negativity of the second derivative are necessary conditions for a minimum, but they're not sufficient conditions for a minimum in calculus because the function can always do something else, be lower down somewhere else. However, in the case where you're minimizing a convex function, then the necessary conditions, the first order condition for a minimum also becomes a sufficient condition. And similarly, if you're maximizing a concave function. Um, and if it's a boundary max, then, then, then the, so, if the minimum of a convex function is obtained on the boundary of a convex set, then the gradient doesn't have to vanish, but it has to point in the direction of the outer normal at that boundary point. So, but somehow there's, for, um, for convex or linear minimizations on compact convex, convex sets, the, um, local necessary conditions 
first and second order. It, actually, first is enough. For a minimum are also sufficient. And that's why you can have these kind of necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, and this is, in some sense, this is uh, what's sometimes called the Kuhn Tucker Koresh conditions. Now, Kuhn and Tucker were doing this in fine, on polytopes in finite dimensions. Um, but in general calculus of variations, the first order condition for minimum is usually called the Euler-Lagrange equation. But when you're in this special setup where it's a minimizing a convex function on a convex set, so that the first order conditions are not only necessary, but also sufficient for a minimum, then you call it the kuhn tucker or the koresh kuhn tucker conditions. Okay, um, right. So what we, so the point is you have this inequality, you have this non-negative function, u of x plus v of y, minus b of xy, which is non-negative everywhere. It's zero on the set of interest where the budget constraint binds. And you, when you have a non-negative function that's zero somewhere, basically, uh, if you're on a manifold where you can do calculus, that means the derivative vanishes. And so now it starts to be useful to assume that m plus is a manifold. So then we can get, we can read into the vanishing of this non-negative function certain second order, first and second order conditions that need to be satisfied. Okay, so I'll write that again on the next page. M plus is a manifold. Then you get where things vanish, you get that the first order derivative has to zero, be zero. So taking the derivative with respect to say x, you get du of x would have to equal dx b of x and y. And you'd also have the second order derivative as positive definite. So you get d2 u of x to be bigger than d2 x b of x y. And I have no problem making assumptions about the smoothness of b let's say twice continuously differentiable uh, in the x variable, the variable that's a manifold. So, I mean, I guess I should really say, um, to, if, I, if I didn't wanna make things symmetrical, I would say something like um, uh, B of Y is C2 and X for every Y. Um, and so the, the derivatives on this side agree and we sort of showed that these dual functions u and v exist, but so far we don't really have any reason to assume they're differentiable. But um, so, um, so we'd have to have these equalities provided, um, let's say this is a first order condition, this is a second order equation where one um, x is a point of differentiability for u and two would hold where x is a point of second differentiability for u. So these two conditions are gonna be satisfied at least at the points where these derivatives exist. And, um, and uh, I guess that uh, I would also, be assuming that x is an interior point on the manifold. So I can, you know, if it's a boundary point, things will be different. I won't have the derivative has to vanish anymore. At interior points. And so it's, so what do I learn from this? Let's, let's think about an example. Let's think about the example of B of x, y, equals inner product of x with y. So then the, its derivative with respect to x is y, its second derivative with respect to x is zero. And so in for this example, condition one says uh, y equals du of x, and condition two says, um, 
second derivative of u at x is non-negative. And so what does that, uh, how do you interpret that example? Right, so uh, Joachim wrote in the chat, the second condition is saying u is convex at x. And if every, if every x is paired with some y, so in other words, if all the women are matched with men, then, u is, then you're gonna have the Hessian if u is non-negative at every x, and so u is gonna be globally convex. And, and how do you interpret the first condition? So the, the first condition is basically telling me which X's and Y's produce equality in this inequality. And it's telling me that the partners that are gonna be matched in the stable marriage problem, the husband's type is gonna be a convex gradient of the wife's type, right? The, the X gets mapped to a Y and the Y is given as a function of the X and the function is the gradient of something convex. And so this is supposed to make you think of Bernier's theorem. So in other words, no matter what distribution, sorry, I, I should have said this is the case, m plus equals m minus equals rn. Um, rn is my favorite manifold. Maybe the unit ball in rn is my favorite manifold. So Brenier's theorem is like the special case of this general duality problem where the, where the payoff, the benefit function is bilinear. And you might say, well, wait a minute, um, wait a minute, Bren in Brenier's theorem, we were looking at a, uh, in Brenier's theorem, we were looking at a cost function, which was like one half x minus y squared, right? So I was trying to minimize that cost. Overall measures with given marginals. But let me expand the square, right? This is this same minimum. And when I expand the square, I have like one half integral x squared d gamma, but, but x squared doesn't depend on y. So integrating that against gamma is like integrating d mu against gamma. And I have integral one half y squared against gamma x y, but since the, the function doesn't depend on x, it's like integrating d mu minus because of the marginal constraints, minus integral of x inner product y d gamma. And so these two terms don't depend on gamma at all. They just measure the variance of the two, the trace of the variance of the two measures mu plus how spread out they are. And then this minus sign here converts them into a max. And so when I want to find the minimizer of the quadratic distance squared Euclidean for fixed marginals, that's the same as finding the maximizer of the inner product of x dot y. And so Brenier's theorem said the minimum here um, min attained by uh, gamma vanishing outside graph g where um, g equals du and u is convex. And we just saw why that should come out of this maximization as well. And so there's one point that we didn't sort of maybe adequately address, which is um, which is on the previous slide, which is, uh, sorry, this slide rather, um, I've reached my maximum number of whiteboards, okay. Which is this, these conditions were conditioned on the function being differentiable and maybe twice differentiable. 
And how do I know that this function u actually is twice differentiable? And it may be, a, and so the idea is that in Brenier's theorem, we also had a hypothesis. We also had that um, provided um, mu plus is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure on our end. And so the point is the convex functions are Lebesgue differentiable almost everywhere. And in fact, admit two derivatives almost everywhere. And so as long as the measure isn't concentrated at points or on subsets of Lebesgue measure zero, um, those two conditions will actually be satisfied by the convex function u. All right, so this is a, a good place to stop. Um, and I'll talk more about uh, how proper, so basically the, the moral of the story is that properties of B, like first and second differentiability of B, to some extent get inherited by the U and the V, at least almost everywhere. And that allows us to do what uh, Hernie wanted to do, which was to reconstruct the gamma, which solves this optimization problem from the U and V, which solved the dual problem. Does anyone have questions, comments? If not, we can transition to virtual office hours. So I will stop the recording.